Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 8th Council meeting. Uh, we are here uh, virtually once again, just out of safety for all the residents and staff, and do appreciate folks joining, whether through the Zoom link or by watching us on Facebook. Again, good evening. Uh, I'm here with Council Member Mendoza, um, our colleagues, uh, Council Member Rout, Council Member Blunt, and Council Member Lundy had prior commitments and not able to join this evening. Uh, so as a result, we do not have a quorum. And so what we will do is uh, just move through information sharing for tonight's meeting and then adjourn. So the um, first item, I know we had the uh, opening prayer on the agenda, I'll go through that, and then just immediately jump into everything else. So Council Member Mendoza, you want to take the prayer or you want me to do it? Uh, let's bow our hands. Uh, dear Lord, uh, watch over us. Watch all over those that need your guidance. Um, Watch for the mayor and council, ensure that they have the wisdom to lead us in the right direction. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Awesome, thank you so much, Council Member Mendoza. We appreciate that. And uh, the first item up on the agenda is the, I'm sorry, following the prayer, is the approval of the agenda, which again, without a quorum, uh, we won't be able to do any formal votes tonight. And that also applies to the approval of the meetings. So we will jump right into the exciting part, which is public comment. Miss Diane Griffin is with us, our uh, town receptionist, and she is going to read the public comments. So Miss Griffin, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Good evening, Mayor James, Councilman Mendoza, staff, residents, town staff. Uh, this um, public comment comes from Steve White. It reads, this email is a follow-up to my February 7, 2021 email and previous emails below. Many residents are very concerned about the recently flooded and ice covered 48th Street. Residents also are also concerned about the right lane on Quincy Street to the 48th Street corner, which was covered with ice forcing vehicles to drive into the oncoming traffic lane. On Saturday, February 6, I sent emails to Bladensburg Police Chief Collington, Purnell in Public Work, and the Ward 1 Council members requesting that they get rid of the ice or close the street for safety. Council Member Rout emailed Chief Collington, and Chief Collington and Purnell quickly responded to make sure the streets were safe. Most of the ice had melted by the time a resident reported the icy street. Purnell set a sent a service request to State Highway to clean out the storm drain to stop the flooding streets. At the February 8 town council meeting, Mayor Jane said she will contact Erica at State Highway to fix the storm drains and check on a nearby bridge that is nearly collapsing. A drainage ditch was dug along Quincy Street to the 48th Street corner to help drain the water on the westbound lane of Quincy Street. He shows a picture that demonstrates photos that were taken during a recent storm. And it shows that the westbound lane is still flooding even after the drainage ditch was dug out. And the top right photo that Mr. Weiss displayed uh, shows the sidewalk and driveway entrance to the market house, which is also flooded due to the clogged up street drain. And the left bottom picture um, Mr. Weiss has shows 48th Street at a flood, flooded at the corner of Quincy Place near the SunTrust Bank parking lot. Every time it rains or snows, these streets are flooded and become ice when it freezes. You may recall I made public comment about these flooded streets over a year ago. See my January 13, 2020 flood, um, public comments below. I have sent many emails and made many public comments about these flooded, flooded and icy streets for over a year now. I hope each of you have taken time to go and see the flooded and icy street 
when it rains or snows. I would think you would have to agree with many concerned town residents who find these flooded and icy streets to be very dangerous to vehicles and pedestrians. These streets have been flooding for many years now and one pedestrian has been killed on Quincy Street many years ago. These flooded and icy streets are very dangerous. The street drains need to be cleaned out and they need to replace they need to replace the broken underground drain pipe as soon as possible. I am asking the town council and staff to give a public update on recent meetings with State Highway to get these repairs done. Please list the State Highway update on these repairs on the March 8th town council meeting agenda and present an update during the public town council meeting. I hope State Highway can make these repairs soon before there is another vehicle or pedestrian accident or fatality. State Highway should give these repairs emergency priority considering the damage and liability these flooded and icy streets present to the public safety. Mr. Weiss, thank you. That concludes the public comments. Great, thank you so much, Ms. Diane for Griffin for reading the comments for us this evening. Uh, at this time, that concludes public comment and we'll move into committee and legislative updates. And then Officer Reinhardt, when you are sharing the code enforcement update, if you wanna share some updates as it relates to SHA and MDOT, that would be helpful and I'll do the same as well. Um, and then we did have Ms. Erica Rigby, who's the um, engineer for our district on the agenda. She confirmed, so I'm not sure if another project came up this evening and she wasn't able to attend, but um, I do not see her listed in the participants, but do want to acknowledge that we'd invited her to come out and speak with us um, regarding State Highway 769C, which is also 48th Street and Quincy Streets. Uh, at this time, we'll move into committee and legislative updates from staff and council. I uh, wanted to give uh, folks on the phone in case there was a uh, committee meeting for any of the committees that you all sit on with COG, a chance to just report out on um, updates. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I currently sit on the uh, Chesa Chesapeake Bay and Water Resource Policy Committee. Um, they just completed their annual report and just want to give a quick update on some uh, policies that they're currently working on. Um, uh, right now, they're working with the um, <clears throat> stakeholders with the state of Maryland, Virginia, and the local municipalities um, on tracking emergency issues um, and also regulations that related to the water quality, wastewater, and stormwater, and drinking water, and collaborating on the best management practices currently. Um, and just a quick note that the uh, CBPC um, was asked for a base budget of $90.5 million, and the Chesapeake Pay Program has been fully funded for fiscal year 21. And that completes my policy report. Great, thank you, Officer Reinhardt. Anyone else on the committees? I know last month I gave an update on the Clean Energy and Environment Policy Committee had met before the February meeting and shared that info. And then our next meeting is scheduled for the end of this month. So I'll have an update at the April meeting. But if there are no other updates, we'll move into Maryland General Assembly updates and just wanna share um, there's still legislation being put forth in opposition to the SD Maglev. And so as a result of that, uh, Delegate Nicole Williams did reach out to Ms. McCutcheon and myself to come uh, onto the virtual hearing and provide testimony for that. The bill that uh, she put forth, it is cross-filed in the state Senate. And so we'd previously given testimony for that. Uh, the purpose of this bill is to prohibit the state or any unit or instrumentality of the state from using an appropriation for a magnetic levitation transportation system located or to be located in the state. And so uh, this is just another effort to try to block this type of um, transportation system from coming to the state uh, through making sure that our tax dollars are not now or in the future appropriated to this particular project. Um, 
And then I do know that um, Council Member Lundy, who sits on the Legislative Committee for PGCMA, had some updates which she said she would bring to the next meeting. But I believe in February, she also shared um, that she was tracking legislation related to law enforcement. So we can ask her about updates on that front as well. But um, if there are no more updates on the Maryland General Assembly, we will move forward. The next item is for Mr. Tonelli, our treasurer under financial business with the constant yield presentation. Hello, Mayor, Council Member, staff, residents. Um, February 14th is Valentine's Day, but it's also another great day because we get a new constant yield notice every year. Um, and this is Rick, I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen here if you can give me access. You got it. Okay. And if I wanted access to, where do I find it, Rick? I'm sorry. Oh, just go to uh, share screen. There she is, thank you. Everybody see it okay? How's magnifications, okay? Okay. Yes, um, good. The constant yield concept. What, and this is a presentation I do every year. I freshen it up. Um, it changes every year. Um, the underlying theory is still the same, but just updated based on our new assessments. Um, the constant yield concept is what tax rate will provide the town with the same property tax revenues next fiscal year as this year. So in terms, mean, meaning keeping revenues constant. Um, now the assumptions with constant yield is as property taxes increase, the tax rates should decrease. So it's offsetting to, to provide the same constant revenues as a previous year. So, so as the assessments go up, property values go up, um, the tax rate should come down. Um, and any rate adopted in excess of the constant yield rate in times of rising assessments um, needs to be advertised as a tax increase. And we have to do a constant yield hearing. And this is legislated under Maryland uh, code under property tax section 2-205. Um, what happens is even if you don't change your property tax rate um, if your assessments rise and then constant yield falls, meaning it wants you to decrease rates because assessments have rised, even though you don't, you, like in the, in the town Bladensburg is, instance, we haven't increased property taxes in Councilmember Mendoza ask you every year, like 15, 20 years at least probably. I think it's been the same rate at 0.74 for a very long time. Yeah, it was probably around 2002 that got there. Yeah, so that was pre most all of us are close. Um, so the current rate's 0.74. So even though assessments have gone up, the economy has improved uh, over the years, um, even though the tax rate hasn't changed, it still advertises a tax increase because constant yield wants you to decrease your tax rate because assessments that have increased, even though it's staying the same. Um, and the constant yield wants to move the property tax annually. So every year we, we, we get the notice on February 14th of our, of our new property tax assessments. Um, this year, our assessments came in at three and a half percent higher than last year. Uh, the way property tax assessments work in the state of Maryland, they assess one third of all the properties in the area every single year. Um, and some years we've had five to six percent increases, other years less. This year is three and a half percent assessments increase. So as a property tax, the total property tax assessments increase, they want the constant yield rate wants to decrease it by three and a half percent down from 74 cents per 100 to 71, 72 cents per 100. Um, and this is assuming all things remain unchanged. Um, municipalities can set any rate regardless of the constant yield, but we have to go through the process. This is a process. It's legislated by the state. 
So what does a notice look like? It looks like this every year. This is, again, you can see it's done on February 14th of every year. This, this is last year, the current year, because it starts for July 1, 2020, carries us through June 30, 2021. So the one on the right is this fiscal year, the one on the left is next fiscal year. And you can see where um, the assessed property this fiscal year right here is $514 million in the town of Bladensburg. It's increasing to $533 million, which is 3.5% increase. Um, and this is our potential revenue to keep the same as last year. So in order to keep the same as last year, they want to constant yield. Constant yield, I talk as a entity, you know, constant yield wants you to decrease your property tax at the same budget revenues as this fiscal year. So you can see there's a 3,803,178. Now, let me back up real quick. Property taxes are about two thirds of, of our total revenues to the town of Bladensburg. They're assessed by the state of Maryland, billed out to residents by Prince George's County, and the residents pay Prince George's County. And then as the payments come in, Prince George's County remits the amounts to the town of Bladensburg. So Bladensburg isn't going out there assessing properties or anything. So, you know, th this is a state legislated county process. And we set the tax rate, or the mayor and council set the tax rate, and we do this through the constant yield hearing and through our budget process. And it's billed out by Prince George's County, and then the and then they remit the funds of Bladensburg so we can provide the services to the town, such as public safety, public works, um, administrative support, and everything else. Um, so this is the revenues this current fiscal year based on 500 almost $514 million of assessed property um, at points at 74. The tax rate is expressed at 74 cents per 100. Um, I just, you know, uh, factor it, you know, in decimal format. So you, you take the total assessments times the 74 cents per 100. It comes with your, it comes to your budget revenues this fiscal year. Next fiscal year is going to increase by 5% to 130,520 because assessments rose 3.5%. Okay, so now this is at assuming we stick with the current tax rate. And this is part of the budget process, you know, the constant yield hearing and everything. Constant yield hearing gives residents the opportunity to comment on the tax rate. So what what has it looked like the last seven years? Uh, to give you an example, um, the dark pink column is our actual property tax rate every fiscal year and planned. I, I should put here planned because this is not set yet for FY 22, um, but it's been 74 cents per 100 of assessed property values. Now I can see in, that, in every year, um, assessments have increased, say, 4.7% in FY16. So the constant yield rate was 4.7% less. They wanted constant yield wanted you to decrease it to 0.70, uh, 70 cents per 100, which is a 4.7 decrease because assessments went up. And you can see that the same goes through every fiscal year. Um, at the high of FY18, Assessments increase 5.4%. You can see the constant yield rate comes down because the higher the assessments rise, the more it wants you to reduce your tax rate. Um, again, this is assuming all things remain unchanged, but in reality is um, because assessments are rising, we also have increased costs as well. Increased costs you know, for, to provide services to the town of Bladensburg. Um, some municipalities change their tax rate every year. Um, and it, and that is up, up to them. Um, I mean, I was, talking to, I was talking to a municipality that 
they're looking at increasing taxes almost 20 cents just to try to catch up yeah um because they need uh, a lot of investment in infrastructure and public safety um and roads and you know they might have to do a one-time um large tax increase so the constant yield is more of a um it's a base process but the, the power and control is still within the municipalities to set to set their rate and you can see what and, and this is just a graph um, linear form what happens when the um, down economy question comes up when assessments actually decrease um, they fall from previous years well we had that in FY 13 can see, and, and that was, um, Councilman Mendoza helped me out, that was the uh, um, the last correction, I guess you could say, with the housing. Yeah, the and, housing crash. Yes, and you can see where assessments dropped 16%. I think Bladensburg was, was in a little bit more favorable area than other areas of the county, but because the assessments dropped 16%, there's one time where the constant yield wanted to go higher than your current tax rate because it's looking at what's going to happen if um, you keep the you know, same tax rate. Um, it, it wants to keep things constant as a year before. So when assessments drop that much and want you to increase your tax rate to compensate yourself for it. We didn't do that, but that's the way constant yield works. That is uh, the, the one instance where assessments decreased versus going the other way. So what happens with the process? Um, we have to advertise um, in a paper, which is getting tougher and tougher to do around here. Um, hopefully that's something we can put in legislation where um, you can advertise other means on social me me uh, media or something like that. But anyway, we have to advertise in a paper and it's set in law um, set in code exactly how you must advertise, and it, it is exactly this. And we, and we even send this off to the State Department of Assessments and Taxation to make sure the ad meets their criteria, and then it's advertised in the paper. And then it's everything I showed you that the assessments are going to rise by 3.5 percent, um, resulting in additional revenues of $132,520 over this fiscal year. Um, but the constant yield rate should be decreased to 0.7151 or 71 cents per 100. And if the town wishes to keep the current tax rate, we have to have a public hearing at our May 10th, 2021 meeting. So that's the process. Um, it's going to be a little bit, uh, they allowed us to add this this year that it's going to be um, done virtually. Um, so people can, can still send in their comments. What's a penny worth? Well, every penny of tax is worth uh, $53,185 revenues to the town. So that's just a quick thing. Um, you know, uh, people like to say, you know, where's my money going or how much is a tax increase going to cost or how much is a cut going to cost. Um, that is just the um, what it costs the town. And when we get into the budget process, you can see how much of our taxes actually go to public safety, public works, administrative, um, general support, um, grants, capital outlay. And that's something we will get into with a budget process. So that is it in a nutshell. Um, if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Tonelli. Council Member Mendoza, any questions from your side? I know you've gone through this several times, um, but I do think it's important to note something that Mr. Tonelli said, which is because we don't play with the tax rate, we leave it steady. It puts us in a position where we have 
that additional revenue, it helps with our reserve fund. So if we hit another COVID crisis and there is no, no grant funding coming from the federal government, we have some funds there that we can utilize to support our residents and continue providing them the services that they need. Um, going back to that chart, which is pretty dramatic when you look at FY13 in particular, for those of us who were here in that housing crisis, we remember seeing all these foreclosures and people just leaving homes that they had been in for decades. And again, to for the town to be able to get through that significant financially devastating period without raising our taxes is huge. And so I know, uh, again, the hearing will be in May, should we decide to leave it um, as it is. And also when the rest of our colleagues can join us at that meeting, but I do think it's important to just say, I am for leaving it at the 0.74 cents per hundred dollars. I don't think it's good practice to start adjusting that and get into a situation uh, where we need a reserve and we have nowhere to go for that support for our residents. Um, um, any we, other comments? Yes, Council yeah, We also didn't have, it, have any furlough, which most of the towns and municipalities and counties have furlough during that time, we didn't. And that's a good point to know, we didn't have to let any of our staff go. And that right, being able to keep their jobs and not for, you know, put them in a position of financial uncertainty is critical as well. That's a very good point. Thank you, council member. Mayor, I think it's also good for the stability for the residents to, to know their taxes aren't going to, you know, so they know what they're going to be paying every, every year. Um, is, 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 instead of like, um, um, I hate to use this analogy, but like a homeowners association has to do like an emergency assessment or something that has to, you know, if they don't have the funds, they, you know, do a special tax assessment or something. Um, we're fortunate we don't have to do that because we have the reserves to operate on, but those reserves, we need to front money for grants and capital projects and also to really, we operate three to four months out of the fiscal year without any revenues because it takes those property tax revenues don't come in until mid-October sometimes. And that's the largest part of our budget. So we have to operate almost, almost over a quarter of the year without any substantial revenues coming in. So we need to have that. So we're lucky and, and we need to have that sort of um, float to operate off of as well. And that's a good point, Mr. Tonelli, because, you know, I've started looking at that and typically it gets a little concerning around September 15th when you don't yeah, see blood that first rises. wave. Yeah, that's it's... right. <laughs> and then if September 30th comes and, you know, when we see that financial report and it's not there and we know, oh gosh, we got to wait until October to get that first hit. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a little stressful. I, I know it concerns me, but as treasurer, I'm sure it keeps you up at night. And I know it's going to happen every year and it's still mm -hmm. stressful every single year. It doesn't mm -hmm. help. It's still, you know, yeah. Like, I could go through it for 20 years and I would still be stressed out about it just because it's, you know, so it's a big chunk. You have to operate right. in the hole. So it's, and that's the part that's, and that's a tough part. And it does really give you a glimpse as to what to expect, you know, once you get that first major um, bump of, of tax mm -hmm. revenue. So yeah, are we going to be ahead or are we lower than projected? So it, well, it, again, it, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in my financial report. Um, just to tack on to that, um, we didn't know what the pandemic was going to, to do to people's ability to pay property taxes. Um, you know, because we were in the middle of a lockdown when we were passing the budget. So we took the projected revenues and we, we decreased them um, by 6%, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a lot because just trying to be conservative thinking that folks wouldn't have the, you know, um, the ability to pay, but fortunately it's worked out better and we're actually um, collecting the revenues and the county is. So that worked out well, but that's another instance that if, if those revenues didn't come in, you know, uh, what w would we do? So, but we're fortunate there. Absolutely. Thank you again for walking us through that. And uh, so when we come back for the April meeting or if there's a budget meeting prior to, would love to get the, the rest of the council's input on that as well. 
At this time, we'll move into the department reports. Um, I do want to let everyone know uh, Chief Collington could not be with us tonight. Um, so please keep him in your thoughts and prayers with the passing of his mother recently. Uh, but code enforcement officer uh, Reinhardt, if you want to give us your updates. Yes, ma'am, and, and mine will be brief. Um, over the past month, we've actually had an uptick of abandoned vehicles in town. And I think a lot of the abandoned vehicles are just people just like dumping vehicles in the town of Blainsburg, um, especially in our residential section. Um, so we had eight abandoned vehicles in the town. Um, we had two in the business area and one in the apartment area. Um, and three of those vehicles were actually impounded. Um, once we put our 48 hour notice on one, um, we usually they disappear, but we had three this month that did not disappear. So we actually removed them from the residential area. Um, I wanna extend a huge thanks out to Public Works. Um, they did an outstanding job over the past month with the, it seemed like almost daily weather episodes we we're having either from the ice and the snow and, you know, them guys did a great job. And I was very fortunate to be able to help them out one day with pre-treat and take me back to my old public work day. So that always puts a smile on my face there. Um, we also uh, did a lot of assisting this past month with the uh, town food drive, which is back up and running and everything. And it's great to see the residents come out and everybody comes out that really benefits from that program that we do. Um, I don't know, I, and I know <clears throat> Mr. Hall is gonna go into this, but I know this has been an ongoing project for quite some time is uh, if everybody's out there seeing riding through town of Blandry, you actually start to see some milling equipment out there. Um, we're finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel with the uh, WSSC project in the uh, underground sewer and water water line replacement on several other streets. So uh, please be patient with them. Uh, buy by the signs that they ask you to have your vehicle moved. Um, please have it moved for them. Um, we're going to get some very, very good, nice, smooth streets very soon. So just be patient with them and, and be patient with uh, us here in the town. And we'll make sure this is a smooth transition that everybody gets some great streets again. Um, that completes my report, Mayor. Great. Thank you, Officer Reinhardt. And you're right. Just a little more patience. We're almost there. It's been three years, um, maybe a hair longer than that, but we're almost there. Lights almost off, going off at the end of the tunnel. Uh, next up, we will hear from Public Works. Uh, yes. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, Basically, I want to um, recite a couple of things what Mr. Reinhardt said. I want to um, I want to thank the guys for doing an outstanding job in the in the snowstorm. Not only did they perform safely in the snow, but they performed safely in the freezing work, freezing rain as well. And also, I know I noticed we had several complaints about the um, 5200 block of Newton Street with the uh, center line, yellow center line fading away. Um, due to the um, cold temperatures, this type of project will have to be done in the springtime when the asphalt warms up. So we're not we're not throwing throwing it off or anything, but to, to have a good good painted surface, you have to wait to the to the uh, weather warm up a little bit. <clears throat> and also <clears throat> also I want to um, reinstate what Mr. Reinhardt said too. If you um if you see any notices that's given to you Please obey so so they can do the work work safely and properly. Thank you. That's the end of my report. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hall, for those updates. And I also want to echo the gratitude with the very, very great <clears throat> work that you and your team did between the sleet storms and the snow and all the crazy weather that we had in February. I can't say what happened once you left the town borders, but it was nice knowing that our streets were well plowed, well salted, pre-treated the whole nine yards. And most people may not realize this, but when that happens, you all go into active mode. And so you're running shifts before most people are even out of bed in the morning or late at night, you know, as they're going to bed, you guys are out there monitoring the road conditions and just doing everything you can to keep us safe. And so I just want to echo the gratitude for all the good work that you all do. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I, if I could just take a pause, um, I, do, I did notice Mr. Derek Gunn is with us from 
the State Highway Administration. Uh, Mr. Gunn, thank you for joining us. We're just going to continue with our um, department reports. We have uh, one or two more to go, and then we'd like to come back and give you an opportunity if you um, are okay with presenting to us, because we did reach out just to see if um, SHA could share some updates as it relates to the work going on on uh, Quincy and 48th Streets. So we'll uh, continue. We have the treasurer's report next, Mr. Gunn, and then we'll come back to you if that's all right. Thank you, Mayor. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Tonelli, over to you. Well, I'll keep this brief, um, Ish, um, because I do want to do a full third quarter report at the April work session um, as, as we get into the budget process. But I'd like to touch on a few things here. Uh, I would like to hear from State Highway, though. But um, this is a summary report of our financials uh, through, through February, which is two thirds of the way through the fiscal year. This is my summary report, but I have full financials. I follow full detailed financials. Um, I can email these out to anybody who needs it. But just to touch on some of the highlights, our revenues uh, were two thirds of the way through the fiscal year, but our biggest driver of revenues, our property tax is, as I talked a few minutes ago, we are ahead of budget because we decreased the amount that we thought we were, we were gonna get into in this fiscal year, but we actually have received all of that or most of it, 98% of it. 97, 98% of it. So that's why it's at 103% of revenues received. The same thing with the personal property tax, that is taxes assessed on, on business personal property. And we have another large round coming through with the April 15th and June 15th tax filings. Um, so we'll, we will see additional revenues in there. Over here in this column, this green column, this is just a comparison of where we were last fiscal year um, at the same time. Um, so we're pretty much on target here uh, compared to last fiscal year. Uh, we're 3% ahead, but uh, with 80% of the revenues in this fiscal year. The big highlight though is our, is our expenditures, our expenses. Um, Two thirds away into the fiscal year, we are our operating expenses are at 55%. Our total expenses are 52% of budget. And our biggest driver, um, well, down here is expenses by department. Every department is operating under budget. Um, we have vacancies, we have some uh, uh, major vacancies in the town. And also what's in here is our COLA and merit, which have not been paid out yet. The merit was approved at the last meeting um, that should be paid out this month. Um, but the largest driver is the vacancies that have occurred throughout the fiscal year. And that gives you budget savings, but at what cost though? Um, at what cost of services not being provided, support not being provided? But, you know, the good news is we're operating under total budget this fiscal year. Um, grants expense, um, we're gonna see this increase as 58th Avenue happens um, which is almost a $200,000 project. Um, we're going to see the um, uh, also the street lighting on 57th and 58th through C community legacy as that's paid out and done. Um, and this is just graphically of, ha of revenue major items compared actual compared to budget. The darker on the back is the actual the lighter up front, I'm sorry, back up. The darker in the back is our budget and the actual up front, the lighter blue shade columns are what we've actually received through February. And this is what, and this is how we build our budget trends. And I mean, and I keep these graphs and reports basically the same each fiscal year. Um, it's not because, you know, we won't change things up, but so we have the good trend so we can go back, it's just trend analysis. And it's all punched into the budget program. Um, and the same with the expenditures by department. You can see the darker columns in the back are the total budget and the lighter columns up front are actual through February fiscal year 21. And we're two thirds of the way through the fiscal year. Um, again, revenues are up, expenses are down. Um, so we're doing well. 
Um, again, detailed financials follow. I put this in the packet every single month. Um, and it's something that we go through and revisit constantly. So it's just part of the process. So if anybody has any questions, comments, answers? Council Member Mendoza, any questions? No. Or to the, from the rest of the team? All right, and Mr. Tinelli, as you said, the, um, the was it the merit we approved last month, the 1.5%, so that'll get paid out in March. Did I hear that correctly? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so just based on this, looking at where we are revenue to expenses, we're well able to cover the COLA, it looks like. I know we, um, when the rest of the council is able to be with us next month, um, we'll plan to revisit that. But it's Absolutely. good to see where we are, you know, in relation to budget right now. Yeah. And as you know, it's just, it's just going to keep, you know, the savings are going to keep continuing. Um, mm -hmm. So because it takes time to fill positions, it takes time to fill executive level positions. So, um, and we do our due diligence with, with any positions that we hire. I mean, it's a full background process, procedure and everything. We just don't, you know, flip through a stack of resumes, pull one out and say, hey, here we go. I mean, it's a, you know, we wanna make sure we're the right people here at Bladensburg um, providing service. Right, absolutely. Thank you again, Mr. Tonelli. I do mm -hmm. want to give some time to our guest, uh, Mr. Derek Gunn, again, who took the time to join us this evening from SHA slash MDOT. Um, Mr. Gunn, wanna turn it over to you to share um, some updates. I think um, from the email you saw that I sent Ms. Mrs. Rigby, we um, just wanted to hear more about the work that we've been requesting on State Highway or State Road 769C. Uh, which is Quincy and 48th Streets in the town of Bladensburg. So we'll turn it over to you for some more information. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council, for having me here tonight. And sorry, it was a little bit erratic getting online. But um, what I would say is this, Erica shared with me some of the concerns and uh, if, you're, if it's your concerns, it's our concern. So 769C, I believe there's two different efforts that are happening right now. One is uh, related to drainage issues. And I, from, from my understanding, speaking with some of our maintenance leads, there has been some work done at that location. And I guess the question is, when can we, from the state highway perspective, get in there and wrap that up? So I do have some good news is that that is on our radar and we got over some hurdles and we're gonna be looking to move that forward this spring to finish up that work. And what I will do is keep the town council and you mayor kind of not, not a blow by blow, but give you a, you know, periodic updates in terms of how that works coming up, coming along. Um, and just to make sure that we're on pace to complete that this spring, but it looks like that's, that's the angle we're going at. Uh, there is another 769C project. This one seems like it's had a little bit longer uh, of a shelf life. Uh, it's more or less, I believe it's ADA type improvement sidewalks on the south side, if, if I'm not mistaken, and then some intersection reworkings and so forth. Now that project, I believe right now that project ran into some challenges with the uh, pandemic and some of, the, some of those concerns. And so right now we're trying to look for opportunities to move that forward. Um, the revenue picture, it's, uh, it's become a little bit more clear. Uh, at least more clear than it was at this time last year. So hopefully we can find some some methods or some 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 ways to to get that one going forward a little bit. But that's another project that will keep the town fully um, abreast of what's happening, and uh, you know if every step of the way. Uh, one one thing I did want to share, and this is just a little bit more broad brushed, is that um, SHA right now we're kind of uh, we're embarking on a new initiative. It, it's very pedestrian safety centric and it's called our, called our context driven design initiative. And really what that is, is looking at um, engineering treatments a little bit differently, trying to partner with the communities and really understand what their needs are out there and not using a one size fits all type prescriptive uh, treatment. So uh, what, what I will do after this meeting, because uh, I, I really do love talking about the context guide. I think it's, a really, it's, it's really neat and it's something that we should have taken on a while ago. But what I will do after this meeting is I'll share a link 
with the town council and uh, be available for any follow-up questions. But we, we're, we have applied that successfully, some of the treatments in that guidance uh, district-wide, Montgomery and Prince George's County, and we've seen some successes. So uh, maybe it's something that we can speak uh, speak, speak about a little bit later and see where there's opportunities for the uh, town of Bladensburg. Great. Thank you, Mr. Gunn, for those uh, updates. I do want to go back to the first item uh, with respect to the work that's being done or was requested with the drainage. Uh, Mr. Hall, our public works supervisor, had received an email the week before last that the work on the pipe and drainage was going to be done over the weekend um, from Friday to Monday. And then um, we didn't hear anything back for a few days. And then I believe it was last Thursday, Mr. Hall, correct me if I'm wrong. He received an email from MDOT indicating that um, they were told to hold off on continuing the work. And this particular uh, work, it's not even um, the bigger scale project that's needed, because uh, I understand funding was an issue, as you mentioned, due to the pandemic, but the compromise was we can, uh, we were told some pipes could be replaced on that stretch of road to help at least alleviate the current situation. And that would be a fix for now until the broader project could have been done. So we were excited about that. We communicated that information to our residents. And then last week, we, um, again on Thursday, I believe the email uh, indicated that higher ups kind of just said, hey, hold up on the work. And so Mr. Hall, do you wanna jump in in case I um, summarized incorrectly or left anything out? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Good afternoon, sir. How you doing? My name is Cornell Hall. I'm the public work supervisor, as the mayor stated. Um, yes, I've been in contact with, with Mr. Greg and also Mr. Soulsby from your department. And and I was I was emailed by Mr. Greg stated that they, they have ha already started salt cutting the route little area, which is about 70, no more than about 75 feet that the drain, the under, um, underground pipe was clogged in their video and they seen. So I asked him a question, why did he get stopped in the middle of a project that was allocated by you all and begin, begin by y'all? So someone else, Mr. Soulsby, I think, stated that y'all not going to do the temporary term as you stated, y'all might do the whole big project. So we was kind of confused of why the guys started it and then got put on hold just for maybe three days worth of work. Understood clearly and thank, thank you, sir. So what I would say is two things. One, uh, Justin Sosaby, he's our newly appointed assistant district engineer of maintenance for Prince George's County. He's, uh, before that he was, uh, he was at our Laurel shop. So he's probably familiar with this area and some of the concerns. Uh, one thing I would say is that I'll, I'll double back with Greg and Justin just to see what some of the, the hiccups were there. But my, my impression right now is that, again, we got over some of our um, constraints and we're just looking to move forward with uh, um, the larger projects sooner than we thought we could. So that might've factored into some of his conversation with you that at that time he wasn't that decision had not been um, reached, but it has now. So I would say this is that, let me check in with both of them and see if what the timelines are on the larger project versus just going forward with the temporary, because for example, it sounded like we were ready to go on the larger project. I said spring to be loose, but it seemed like it might be even sooner than that. So if that's the case, then that's probably what we would, def you know, that's what the deference was. But let me, let me uh, kind of retract a little bit and see where that stands and get you Pretty good answer on timelines uh, following this meeting. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And Mr. Gunn, we do appreciate that. So it does sound like things were moving in tandem, people proceeding with work on the smaller project while the powers that be were working on the bigger, um, much higher um, concern. So we're definitely grateful for that. Um, Mr. or Council Member Mendoza, did you have any questions or anyone else from the staff that you wanted to raise while we have Mr. Gunn with us? 
No, I appreciate you, Mr. Gunn. Thank you. And one thing I would say to kind of conclude is that, you know, at the district, since it's operations and some of the folks on the DPW side can attest to this, things move very quickly. So decisions, decisions that were ago, a week ago, sometimes get superseded, unfortunately. And this looks like that might've been the case here. But what we will do to follow up is one, if, if I could, I'll share with the town a resource guide um, of everyone at the district and certain points of contact for certain specific concerns. And I, I think that's a, that's a good tool. And then we will share those more schedules with the town on the drainage issues. And if we get any more information on the, on the uh, pedestrian safety project. Thank you, Mr. Gunn. And then just one um, follow up question. So as you're uh, coming along um, 48th and Quincy Street, as you're exiting out of the town, the, the bridge there is, I just want to make sure I'm clear, is that included in the bigger project? Because that is also a concern in addition to the pipes and the drainage issues. Um, I drove over there on Saturday and that road just looks like it could go in, in, in any minute now. I hate to say it that way, but it's just the, the infrastructure is failing. So I just want to be clear, is that included in the larger project? I want to say yes, but let me make sure before I okay. miss the, uh, one of the time. Yeah, let us and know. If know not, it. we'll start uh, moving emails and letters and whatever to you know help support you in getting approval for that. Understood. And, let, and if I can say is, uh, or if I can share this, actually, I, I don't live too far from Bladens, Bladensburg. I'm right down the street in Chevrolet. So I'm very familiar with the area and, you know, hopefully we can all kind of get to those uh, final uh, resolutions and help. You help you. Definitely appreciate that. Okay, I promise that was the last question. <laughs> we will let you go. <laughs> um, but certainly appreciate it and look forward to following up over email to keep the progress on this moving forward. And of course, if you all need anything from us, we're here to assist as well. But again, just thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Everyone have a good night. You as well. May thank you. Yes. Mayor James. Mayor James. Hello. Good Hi, Ms. Zamet. Good evening. Uh, thank yeah. you for joining us. So everyone, Ms. Elaine Zamet is a representative from Senator Malcolm Augustine's office. Um, some of the emails that were sent regarding the, um, the State Highway Administration issue, she was helping to escalate those on the state side while staff was, you know, working through um, their colleagues uh, as well. And so Ms. Zamet, I do want to thank you for your support and you know, doing everything you could to just make calls and emails to ensure that things were moving forward, but do want to give you an opportunity to speak as well. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting us to the, your work session uh, this evening, particularly uh, this one, uh, as it uh, you know, pertains to a lot of the construction work and the projects that are ongoing you know, in the area. And uh, I got a, a wealth of information uh, from uh, Mr. Gunn and all of the other uh, participants. And I really am so happy to have joined us because this helps us to make sure that we're doing the right thing, that Senator has his finger on the pulse of the community. And this is a very good kind of like uh, session whereby we learn information at the same time we can gather more support for the ongoing projects. And I just want to take this opportunity, of course, you know, Senator, we're in the thick of it with session and uh, moving along under very different circumstances virtually. And uh, I must say, I'm prejudiced. I'm very proud of the state of Maryland for how we just kind of can <laughs> move ahead. And with leadership like yours, Mayor James, that shows that we, we can do the best we can under the most difficult and unforeseen of circumstances. So I just want to uh, take this uh, opportunity. Senator, as you know, he's working. Um, one of his main focus right now is um, he's working on mental health, trying to make sure the, the community is healed from inside out, with stronger communities, stronger families, stronger neighborhoods. And we thrive more than survive. So that's one of uh, the main focus. But uh, Ken, once again, the environment, you know, making sure our bridges, our streets, Safe, uh, making sure that our community uh, is a place where people can 
really have a very high standard, a very healthy standard of living. So I'm, I'm not gonna take up too much time <laughs> because I know you had a, a robust agenda, but I do want to say thank you so much for this uh, evening's meeting because I learned a lot and now I'll be able to take more back to the Senator and work with you, Mayor, um, on a continuing basis. So thank you very much. And thank you so much for Mr. Gunn. And I ask that everyone please include Senator Malcolm in everything uh, that you uh, do moving ahead so that we can all be on the same page. Thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you as well. And I appreciate your kind remarks, but I'm part of a team. And so I wanna take my hats off to our amazing staff and our council members. Absolutely, uh, It's a team Absolutely. effort. And um, so I definitely can't take all the credit. I do appreciate the accolades yes. and you know, express the same sentiment to you all. We appreciate all of Senator Augustine's support um, with any bills that are on the horizon and any support needed, please let me know so we can be here um, to testify or write letters, whatever mm -hmm. you all need. We're here to work together. Right. So we want to keep that momentum going throughout the remaining part of the session. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And at this time, uh, we will jump into the mayor and council report. So council member Mendoza, I'll turn it over to you. Good evening, mayor and Council and uh, staff and uh, audience. Um, the other day I got a phone call from somebody about the maglev, which it was I, I believe was really interesting because they're trying to see if we want to support the maglev. And I had to tell them that we've been against it since day one. And these are some um, some elected official within Maryland, within Prince George's that were trying to reach me. And I was like, well, I really can't discuss much. I mean, I could listen to you, but that's all I could do. So just want to be aware that there, there might be some people calling some of us, you know, trying to influence us in some ways. So just want to put that out there. And I also want to thank everybody who participated in the Black History Month. It was a wonderful event. They thank everybody, the staff and the council and the mayor, you guys all did a great job. You know, it was really awesome. And, uh, you know, it's really good that even do, during the pandemic, we still managed to have a good time. And that's all I have. Great, thank you, Council Member Mendoza for all your work on behalf of the community and for being a part of the Black History Committee this year, as you've done many years before. It was great to see new folks getting involved from the staff, along with some of our veterans like Miss Diane <laughs> coming together and putting together a great program. Uh, with respect to my updates for this month uh, or the month of February meetings and activities, I did meet with Maryland Energy Administration, uh, specifically Eric Kaufman, the director of programs and his team. And I wanna invite him out to a future council meeting to share with our residents some of the programs that are available. Um, and then also to share with the council and staff some of the resiliency programs that we can go after grant funding for in order to, again, looking back at the flood situation and other weather situations, make sure that our community is properly um, structured or that, that we have the right resources in place so that we can withstand those kinds of things. They also um, took a great deal of time to mention some of the uh, programs they have for the business community as well. So definitely was a fruitful meeting. I appreciate the police department for putting together the cookies and hot cocoa and taking that event throughout the town to give us an opportunity to get together to see residents that we haven't really been able to engage with due to the pandemic. I wanna thank all the residents for coming out and just taking the time to uh, connect with us. I think someone might be unmuted there. I'm hearing some background noise. Uh, but again, appreciate the community action team leading the way with that and the other officers being a part supporting along with chief and the command staff and the council for coming out as well. Um, 
we did uh, them actually the African American Mayors Association, we had a listening session with Vice President Kamala Harris on February 10th. And it was to give us an opportunity to hear plans from the administration and how they'll translate back to smaller communities such as ours and really have the opportunity to talk about the American Rescue Plan, the relevance to American families and businesses. Um, so it was a, a unique opportunity. I, was hoping to have a chance to talk with her, didn't realize it would come this soon in the administration's time, but it was definitely fruitful to have that opportunity to share concerns um, at the highest level of our government. And a um, couple of other things I wanted to mention, um, please continue to keep our firefighter Evan Webster in your prayers. Uh, there was a bad fire in early February and he did suffer some injuries. He was hospitalized, but he is back home now continuing to recover. But again, please keep him in your prayers. I think sometimes we take for granted the good work our public safety agencies do on our behalf. And when we're running from danger, they're running in. And so um, again, just any thoughts and prayers that you can extend for Evan would be greatly appreciated. But as I said, he is on the road to recovery and there was a big welcome effort that the fire department put together uh, just to celebrate him and help encourage him. So it was definitely good to be a part of that. And then uh, on February 18th, again, the African American Mayors Association hosted another listening session. This time it was with Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. And that was really important because as you know, the maglev is of con uh, considerable concern for our communities. And so having the opportunity to tell him directly that <clears throat> this is a concern on so many levels as you talk about environmental justice and inequities, um, selling these projects that dissect and disrupt minority communities in order to benefit more affluent communities, which are things that he identified as priorities for the administration. It was good to be able to just tie that directly back to his or his conversation and remarks with us to say, and this is why we need your support in stopping this train from coming through our community. So I think it went well. It was definitely a good opportunity to again have um, that up close and personal conversation with a member of the administration and sharing opportunities <clears throat> for a smaller community. You know, oftentimes they hear from the big cities. So to have little Bladensburg <laughs> represented <clears throat> was a of a particular honor as well. The um, Boswick House uh, Stakeholder Group is continuing to meet. And again, as a reminder, that group was brought together with a diverse group of experts from the community and stakeholders to help come up with ideas and plans for economic development to help not just preserve the house, but come up with a viable plan so that we can use that to um, celebrate our history, have possibly a museum, have economic development um, tied to it as well. And so those meetings did continue on in the month of February. I also had the opportunity to attend the school board meeting that was held on February 25th and just understand the current issues and dynamics of the school board and encourage our residents, particularly those with school aged children to please tune into those meetings. If your children are in public schools, you need to understand what our elected officials are doing or are not doing to advance our schools. And particularly given that that budget for the school system is over $2 billion, we need to hold them accountable if they're obstructing progress that is desperately needed to move our school system forward. As Councilmember Mendoza mentioned, the Black History Month was a success, our first virtual one, but it came together and I wanna thank the team. Uh, again, Councilmember Mendoza, Ms. Diane Griffin, Natasha Adams, Kim Green, Council Members Lundy and Route as well, and Councilmember Blunt. Uh, everyone contributed ideas and helped and it came out uh, very well. I also wanna thank again, um, the team for deciding to recognize our first African-American mayor and David Harrington. I think that was definitely befitting to take a look back at history, but then also to celebrate a piece of our more recent history in our first African-American mayor. And then finally, in terms of upcoming events, I wanna mention I was asked to testify this coming Thursday um, the Prince George's County Council will be meeting or sit convening as a, um, as a whole. And the presentation that they'll be receiving is on the Northeast Maglev. So they'll hear from them. 
uh, I was invited to attend along with Maryland Park and Planning Commission and some other community advocates in order to uh, just, again, communicate the issues that we have with this project in hopes that the County Council will continue to support. I do wanna thank them though, um, up to this moment, they've been nothing but stellar from Council Member Ivy to Council Member Glaros Hawkins. They've been very outspoken. And so I do applaud them actually taking the time to add this to the agenda and give it the time and weight that it, it deserves is definitely appreciated. And again, that's on Thursday. I am uh, as a follow up working with Susan McCutcheon to put together a workshop. It'll be an easy tutorial for residents to tune in to understand now that the DEIS report is out, how we're gonna walk you through how to submit your comments. We're gonna show you how to do the quick version all the way up to if you wanna be highly technical, how to cite different aspects of the remarks, but we just wanna make it simple. So we're gonna spend an hour on a Saturday morning on March 20th, just walking you through how to submit your comments. And thank you, Ms. McCutcheon for um, offering to be our, our tutor <laughs> to walk us through the tutorial on that. Um, the other item is Earth Day is coming, and as I shared in the work session, we do want to do something big. It is the 10-year anniversary for Sustainable Maryland, who certifies sustainable communities and recognizes all of their green efforts, and so we do anticipation of that celebration and Earth Day. We do just want to make a big splash about it, so just be thinking about it. Just know we'll be coming back with more details and asking for volunteers, students, who need community service hours, anyone who wants to help, um, how to, we'll give that information on how to participate in a variety of uh, green efforts in recognition of Earth Day. Um, and then finally, I did wanna say, I am very concerned about some of our residents who are not able to physically go and be vaccinated due to mobility issues. And so if you know of someone in that situation who does not have a loved one who can take them to be vaccinated or does not have access to transportation, could you just please email me and let me know. I'm trying to track that and communicating with the county about how to assist those residents, again, who cannot physically go to these vaccination sites, but who meet the criteria in order to be vaccinated. Um, that would be very much appreciated. I'm working with the county on something to address that and would appreciate your help. And with that, that uh, concludes my report for tonight. Let me just scroll down here on the agenda. I think there was one more item, but this will have to be tabled and, um, or actually not necessarily, I'm sorry. So with the appointment of the supervisors of the elections, um, we did not appoint a new board um, per our charter by March the 1st. And so the, the existing board just continues their term. So um, according to our legal counsel, we don't need to vote or anything like that. The understanding is they just continue on. So do wanna make that available uh, to everyone. Um, that information, uh, just wanna make that available. And our board of supervisors consists of Mr. Owen Clark, Ms. Rita Herndon, Ms. Judy Sojourner, Ms. Joyce Williams, Ms. Myrtle Lane, and Ms. Pat Williams. So I wanna thank each and every one of you for stepping up to serve your community. And we appreciate how year after year, you all find a way to get it done and you serve with a smile on your face. So we certainly appreciate that. Um, are there any other updates before we wrap up here? All right, hearing none, we will let everyone go, but I certainly appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight and hope that you found the information valuable. Please stay safe. Um, again, thank you for all the residents who took time to honor Af um, Black History Month last month. And today is International Women's Day, so hopefully you took time to celebrate uh, or just create a post or do something to honor that day um, as well. With that, I wish you all a good night and we'll see you back here in April. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Good night.